Welcome. Today we are having for our guest lecture uh, Paul Corcoran. Paul is a PhD student, he's just completing his research at the Lyola Institute in Trinity College, Dublin. He's a qualified post-primary teacher of English and religion and he has taught in a variety of schools including in Clongos, in Belvedere and in Gonzaga. Paul has published some of his work in studies and he's just about to submit his doctoral thesis and he has a fascinating presentation for us today on wonder in education beyond the tedious monotony. No tedious monotony today. Welcome to the Irish Institute for Catholic Studies, Paul, and over to you. Thanks, Patricia. So, uh, thank you everybody for being here today, for having me in Mary I. Um, and I'm very excited to share with you some of my research which has been in this area of wonder. And I've come at this from various different angles. Wonder in education, wonder in the arts, wonder in religion and theology. And today I'm kind of bringing together those various different strands into one presentation under the heading Wonder in Education Beyond the Tedious Monotony. And that quote, I will explain a little bit more as we go along. It will hopefully become clear what I mean by that and how wonder can help us move beyond the tedious monotony that perhaps we're all familiar with at times in the education process. So, what will we be talking about today? Well, this is the structure I'm hoping to go through. Part one will be defining wonder because question you might have is what is wonder? What are we talking about when we say wonder? So first part would be defining wonder. Part two, wonder in decline, which is something that is going to set the context really for wonder in education in part three. And finally, as I said, moving beyond the tedious monotony in the conclusion towards resonance. This word that I will return to and explain what I mean towards the end of the presentation, but that will hold the key really to moving beyond tedious monotony, especially with our use of wonder in the classroom and wonder in education. So that's the structure we're hoping to follow today. And firstly, defining wonder. Wonder is one of those words that is used by many different disciplines in many different ways. And while that is wonderful and exciting, that interdisciplinarity, it can also pose challenges because a common set of terminology is important in order to ruse and ground any discussion about wonder. So, defining wonder. What will I mean when I say wonder? I mean that wonder is characterized really by two things. An encounter with the unknown and a sense of importance. So you encounter something you're not quite sure about and you know in some way that it's important, that you want to incline towards it because it has some importance. According to William Desmond, who's done a lot of work on this, he says wonder is less a concept, an intellectual concept, than a happening. Something that happens, an experience, experiential really. This happening cannot be self-activated or easily controlled. With wonder, we are struck. We're struck with wonder, that phrase. We're struck with wonder within, by something outside of our grasp. So you can see why, why wonder is challenging, in a way, because we can't easily control it. It's something almost that happens to us and brings about something within us that can be exciting, but also challenging. So that's important to note right away. It's neither subjective nor objective. What does that mean? Well, it's neither completely down to your own experience because wonder kind of takes away control from you. So it's not entirely subjective, but it's of course not objective either. What would be wonderful to one person wouldn't be wonderful to someone else. So it's neither. It's what's called by Pickstock and Desmond transsubjective and transobjective, which captures the sense in which wonder takes us outside of ourselves and creates however fleezingly, a kind of openness or porosity to the mystery of the world around us. And openness is a word that really 
characterizes wonder. It opens us up to something else. And indeed, this may excite us, it might stupefy us, or it might even nauseate us. It might make us uncomfortable. But crucially, there is this sense that wonder is outside of our control and our attempts to channel it or understand it or regulate it. Even as much as we might want to do that at times, we can't. Wonder takes us outside of ourselves and outside of our own control. So how do we ground this conversation then? Well, I'm, I'm talking about three modalities of wonder. Um, and why is wonder so broad? Well, because in disciplines as broad as philosophy, religion, education, art, science, wonder is really crucial to the processes of those disciplines. And to account for all this variety and diversity, Big Stock and Desmond again have come up with these three modalities of wonder. Curiosity, perplexity, and astonishment. So those three are really going to ground our discussion today by what we mean when we say wonder. And I'll explain those three different modalities, those three different types of wonder as we go along. So firstly, curiosity. Curiosity, as you can see here by our illustration, is the most inquisitive and pragmatic of the three modalities. It's driven by the desire to move by inquiry from an initial incomprehension. You don't know what something is. It's the unknown. But you're going to inquire into it. And then you're going to acquire some new knowledge. And Desmond characterizes this by the phrase, what is? What, what is that? I want to know more about that. I'm going to inquire into it and find out something new. Give me that knowledge. I want that knowledge. This wonder doesn't penetrate too deeply into our spirit. It gives way to an answer. And then it kind of subsides. If you want to know what is that, you inquire about it. You find out the answer. And then the wonder kind of subsides. And that's neither good nor bad per se. It's just what characterizes curiosity as a modality. Perplexity then, slightly different. As, as we might understand by that term, it's this sort of puzzlement. When we're overcome by what Desmond calls the too muchness of the world. This can be quite challenging. Because as much as we try to snatch the meaning of the world to ourselves, the surplus of meaning in the world reminds us of our own limitations at times and our own ignorance. We want to control the world, we want to understand it, we want to inquire and know about it, but sometimes we're struck with perplexity. And we say, as Desmond says at the bottom here, what the hell is, what the hell is that? I don't understand it. And I don't know if I can get an easy answer in the same way that I might with curiosity. And Plato's cave, the sort of parable of Plato's cave, is a paradigm for perplexity. So there's this interplay of light and dark. You're not quite sure where the answer is, where the truth is. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about perplexity. Our limitations, our ignorance. What the hell is that? Finally, then, the third modality is astonishment. And again, this is the most contemplative element of wonder. It's a wonder that appreciates that it is at all. Another phrase that Desmond uses. So the fact that we're here at all, that things exist, that we might not exist, that the world around us might not be as it is, and that sort of contemplative wonder or astonishment that celebrates that mystery. So this word mystery is important when we talk about wonder, and astonishment leans into that mystery. It's comfortable with mystery. It resonates with it. Uh, and as such, astonishment is the modality of wonder most at home with the transcendent. Those things which transcend our traditional understandings of the world. Most at home in places like religion um, and even places like art as well. Uh, it resists, I like this phrase, it, re it resists the modern trivialization of wonder. The gosh wow experience of the strange. So today our experience of wonder might be trivial. We'll talk about that as we go along. Things like social media, things like technology have created this gosh wow experience of the strange. But astonishment goes deeper. Uh, it retains an ontological bite, philosophical really, uh, that embraces the boundaries of being and indeed the possibilities of not being. The gratuitous and contingency of life. 
So are these three modalities separate, or is there a way that we can combine them into maybe an ideal kind of wonder? And again, Desmond and Pickstock suggest that this is possible. In their work, they consider the possibility of an ideal blend of wonder, what they call a redeemed integration of the three modalities of curiosity, perplexity, and astonishment. They seem to conclude that this is, uh, this is possible, and in fact, it's something that would be characterized by this hithering and dithering, where the different modalities run in and through each other. Those are the most resonant experiences of wonder that move beyond the surface level and make possible an encounter with the unknown that opens us up, that humbles us in some way, and that can transform us as well. These are the most resonant experiences of wonder when we experience all three of curiosity, of perplexity, and also of astonishment. So this is something to keep in mind as we go through the presentation today. Where are the moments in different disciplines and maybe in education and our own practice where we can approach this sort of redeemed integration where we have all three of curiosity, perplexity, astonishment. And there are some examples I want to give you of where this happens and what the effects of it are when we combine the three modalities. So, the area of philosophy. I want to talk about philosophy first because the philosophical tradition has long appreciated the importance of wonder. And Socrates, I suppose, is the paradigm for this. Um, he calls wonder the pathos of the philosopher. Um, it's a wonderful passage. I, I teach Greek and I was, I was reading that passage with my Greek students through the night and they're kind of beginning Greek. And I said, let's read this passage in Greek, this passage of Plato. And we read that passage. It's just, it's chilling almost to read Socrates describe the place of wonder and how important it is to the philosopher. Um, and he approaches this redeemed integration. Uh, his inquiries into the opinions of others often end in aporia, this Greek word, which literally means there is no way forward. Um, aporia means you just get to say, I don't, I don't know the answer. That's often where Socrates gets to. That's the end of his philosophy. And you can see where wonder comes into that. You say, well, I can wonder at the unknown. I can approach it in inquiry, but I may not get an answer. Um, for Socrates, to understand clearly the terms of his own ignorance is the summit of philosophical knowledge, in fact. So wonder is crucially important in that. With his predilection for the unknown and the unknowable, Socrates injects an element of humility into our search for wisdom. Um, his Socratic method, where he repeatedly questions his interlocutor until they collapse into ignorance, offers a unique blend of these three modalities of curiosity, puzzlement, and astonishment. Socrates is genuinely curious about the opinions of the people he's talking to. He says, tell me about that. What, what are you talking about? I want to hear more about your opinions. He's curious. Um, and he undertakes inquiries to test the wisdom of their knowledge. He grapples head on with the fearful too muchness of the world, that perplexity. And he concludes regularly that he's unable to unlock the secrets of existence. But decisively, he's comfortable with uncertainty. He's comfortable with mystery. It doesn't overcome him or reduce him to a state of denial, pride, or stupor, as it does his interlocutors often. His inquiries go on, driven by the conviction that the unexamined life, as he says in the Apology, is not worth living. He says elsewhere in the Apology, I neither know nor think that I know. So he has that humility. I will inquire, I will not find the answer, but that's okay. And that in itself is wisdom. So Socrates gives us, and he gives the philosophical tradition, a real example of what redeemed integration of wonder looks like. All three, curiosity, perplexity, and astonishment, are clearly visible in Socrates. And it's really exciting to see that at work. So we move now from philosophy to another discipline, theology. So what does theology have to say about wonder and its place? And I will take Thomas Aquinas as the sort of paradigm for another redeemed integration of curiosity, perplexity, and astonishment. Um, remarkable 
in his work on wonder is the balance he strikes between the three. He defines wonder in his summa as a certain desire for knowledge. A certain desire for knowledge, which might seem very much like curiosity. He wants knowledge. He wants to inquire and find knowledge. And God, in fact, has gifted us reason, ratio. Uh, he's gifted us reason to do that. Our reason, our human reason, according to Aquinas, is a gift from God that allows us to attain some knowledge of the divine and advance our faith. So there's the curiosity of it. But however, crucially, Aquinas balances this with the apophatic streak in his work. The apophatic streak is that acknowledgement of the ineffability of God. We will never understand God fully. He is unknowable in his essence. And the summit of our knowledge of God is prayerful contemplation of that mystery. So by the end, here he says, this is the summit of humankind's knowledge about God, that it knows nothing about God. So you can see on the one hand, he has that drive to inquire and learn more about the divine, using his ratio. But on the other hand, he says, well, ultimately, we will never know anything about God. Which is a striking balance. How can both be held in counterpoise? But they are in Aquinas. And that's why he is another example, this time in theology, of that redeemed integration of the three modalities of wonder. The final example, I want to talk about the arts. Wonder and the arts. And the example I give is Seamus Heaney. Uh, a few interviews he gave before his untimely death really strike uh, this sort of redeemed wonder. He commented shortly before his death that the biggest shift in my lifetime has been the evaporation of the transcendent from all our discourse and sense of destiny. The evaporation of the transcendent. So he recognized there was something happening in his lifetime and that wonder had something to do with this. You can see where wonder might come into it. Uh, Healy has been called God shy by Unagni, which I like this phrase. He, he wasn't speaking in theological terms here. He didn't want to necessarily get in and unpack that. But you could see he's getting at something to do with wonder here. He was talking about society's increasing inability or unwillingness to come to terms with what he called in another interview, in-betweenness. The metaphysical half-spaces of life where the stuff of myth and mystery and poetry and the transcendent lie close. His comments evince the kind of resonant wonder so central to art. I like the in-betweenness, he said, of up and down of being on the earth and of the heavens. I think that's where poetry should dwell, between the dream world and the given world. So you could see that's impossible without wonder, without a balance of curiosity about the given world, this material world that we live in, but without this astonishment at the dream world, at the heavens, the transcendence of life. So I think Heaney, without using maybe theological language or the language of wonder per se, is getting at here where wonder lies in the world of art. And it's opening us up to this in-betweenness where artists really reside, in between the given world and the dream world. So those are three examples of what I am talking about, this redeemed integration of curiosity, perplexity, and astonishment. So I just want to maybe build on what Heaney said. Wonder in decline is part two. And you can see that Heaney was touching on that when he said the evaporation of the transcendent that took place in his lifetime. And many commentators have acknowledged the same thing, that wonder today is in decline. Why is this? Well, the sense of mystery that accompanies wonder unsettles us today, I think. Because today we're increasingly preoccupied with solving rather than contemplating what remains outside of our grasp. Meanwhile, the interiority that wonder encourages lies at odds with a distracted world that exists increasingly at the surface level. So if we encounter mystery today, we want to solve it because knowledge is power. Information is power. It might even be money as well. So we don't want to say, oh, mystery is good for mystery's sake. We want to say, mystery needs to be solved. Mystery needs to be mastered for profit, probably. Or we're too distracted 
to actually dwell on the unsettling aspects of mystery that the world presents us with. So maybe that is why wonder today is in decline. And um, John Hodge, he did some research in the 1980s, and he identified this, what he called an epistemology of control that resists wonder and perplexity. So this epistemology of control prioritizes the acquisition of knowledge for the measure of control and power it gives us over our surroundings. The manner in which wonder reduces us to being struck by ignorance or unimportance or contingency poses a threat to the epistemology of control. Insofar as wonder is relevant or desirable at all, it is a narrow form of curiosity that initiates a new bound of problem solving and progress. So to this epistemology of control, wonder is actually a threat. We don't want to reside in mystery and dwell in mystery because that reminds us that we're ignorant. And it poses a threat to this spirit maybe of capitalism where we want new knowledge, new information so we can constantly make progress. We don't want to know about mystery. We want to know about control. So that's what John Hart recognized in the 1980s. And a recent collection in 2019 by Fran O'Rourke says much the same thing. It's a, it's a collection on the philosophy of religion. And in his introduction, O'Rourke says the following. Modernity has robbed mankind of its gods and leached the world of mystery. Our sense of wonder has largely evaporated. There is little that astonishes or startles us. The world has become all too familiar. We assume science has solved the great questions with little residue for reflection. It could be argued that the lack of a sense of transcendence springs from the loss of wonder. So that summarizes really the state of play today. It's an astonishing quote, uh, if you'll excuse my use of the word astonishing. Uh, it's a very striking quote. And I think it summarizes a lot of what we probably know of the modern world just by our sense of it. That it's leached of its sense of mystery. That wonder has largely evaporated. The same word, interestingly, that James Heaney used uh, about the transcendence. It's evaporated. It's disappearing around us. Wonder is no longer relevant because everything's been solved. We can control things now by solving them. And we don't need things like transcendence because we don't need wonder. So the two you can see are connected. And this is largely the state of play today. Um, when I think of wonder, I think of this. This is what I think of now. If you Google wonder, you'll probably well, you'll come up with a Scandinavian furniture multinational rather than an ontological bite that Desmond talks about. So wonder, as I, as I contest, uh, contend, has been flat-packed and marketed as yet another lifestyle product, where the wonderful every day is more recognizable as a catchphrase uh, to be marketed at us than for its ontological bias. You too can have a wonderful life, not in any uh, kind of resonant sense or meaningful sense, but just as a lifestyle product. Things can be wonderful for you too. And I don't mean to criticize Ikea, but it's just, it's funny, it strikes me as funny that this is where most people would come in contact with wonder today, in marketing or things like that. Um, if you said wonder to a, an audience or a group of students or a group of people off the street, they might come up with a phrase like this before they would come up with anything philosophical or transcendent. Um, so let's be realistic about that. Um, Pope Francis, interestingly, has touched on this exact same thing. This is where the tedious monotony comes from. It's a quote from Pope Francis. He's aware that Christianity is not immune from the crisis of wonder in society. In fact, he's placed it at the very heart of Laudato Si, his defining work. He calls for a bold cultural revolution against the spirit of globalized technology, where a constant flood of new products coexists with a tedious monotony. Let us refuse to resign ourselves to this and continue to wonder about the purpose and meaning of everything. Otherwise, we would simply legitimate the present situation and need new forms of escapism to help us endure the emptiness. So without wonder, without meaning, without transcendence, what we have is emptiness. We have a tedious monotony. 
which I just thought was a striking phrase. It's why I took it as the heading of my presentation. Because even Pope Francis, he's not really speaking in theological language here. Of course, he's a religious figure, but he's speaking almost as a sociologist, saying that this is what technology, this is what the modern world is demanding of us. This sort of escapism uh, from the emptiness of life without wonder. So I thought it captured this topic quite well. Um, this sounds very pessimistic now. We're, we're talking in part three about wonder and education, and you're probably wondering at this stage, um, where's the hope? You know, if wonder is in decline, uh, how can it be of any use in the classroom? How can we generate it or explore it in the classroom, in education? Well, uh, I have some hope and I have some pessimism, and I'll share both with you. Uh, just to begin, wonder is actually the focus of increasing attention in the most recent educational literature. Uh, Schinkel, who's written a lot on this, said recently, to experience wonder is to experience a combination of puzzlement and a sense of importance. In wonder, one's attention is arrested by something that puzzles or mystifies, or sometimes surprises one, yet at the same time, appears worthy of one's attention for its own sake. So you can see Schinkel is, without even maybe meaning to, is capturing the three modalities there. Uh, puzzlement, mystification, surprise, it kind of fits in somewhat to curiosity, to perplexity, to astonishment. Um, and that does come out in the literature. Um, I like this bit of research uh, from Whitehead. The romance of learning. Wonder can inject romance back into learning. And what does that mean, romance in the learning process? Well, it's actually the most important part of the learning process, according to Whitehead, because wonder is crucial at the beginning of the learning process. Without a romantic, excited infatuation with a new topic, students cannot proceed to further stages of precision and generalization. You need to get excited at the beginning. The greatest problem identified by Whitehead is the skipping of the romance stage in the learning process. As Whitehead observes, the crucial romantic stage of the learning process is dominated by wonder and cursed by the dullard who destroys wonder. So you might recognize in your own head, maybe in your own practice, uh, those moments when you have destroyed wonder or witnessed the destruction of wonder in the romantic stages. So this is, this is the hope, but also the warning. If you can inject wonder into especially the initial phases of learning, then anything is possible. If you skip that stage, here, here's the info. doesn't matter why it's important. Here it is. You need to learn it. Do it. Then you're cursing the student and you're cutting off the possibility that they have a real encounter with the material at hand. So this is a really nice place to start. Um, the role of the teacher, you can, you can surmise then what the role of the teacher is here. It's really important. The role of the teacher is really important because they have the responsibility to model the wonder they wish to see in their students. You have to show them that something is exciting. The educator's wonder can here be the spark that lights the child's wonder. Or it can fan the flame that is already there. Wonder can be contagious. The teacher's wonder is directed at some object. This suggests to the child that there is something wonderful about it. And that means it is worth getting to know. So that might sound very obvious, but we're all guilty of those times when we don't show the wonder. And what do we expect then of our students? They're not going to uh, magically pick this up by themselves. We need to model the wonder uh, for our students. Um, curiosity is king, is the phrase I use, because curiosity is actually the, mod the modality of wonder most um, credited and most valued in education. Um, this is a more inquisitive wonder, defined by Schinkel as the drive to investigate the what, how, and why of what aroused one's wonder. Studies into curiosity link with motivation, perseverance, and the establishment of goals. Curiosity is also credited with the role in creating deep-seated interest in students, which can help the development of all sorts of things, like self-regulation and information seeking. So curiosity is great by the sense of That's what the literature would suggest, that curiosity is the type of wonder we need to lean into in education. And 
you'll see that all over the place. Uh, the junior cycle, uh, revised um, specifications, and you'll see the key skills uh, and curiosities mentioned there. It's mentioned, it will be mentioned, I'm sure, in the revised leaving cert that is being produced at the moment. And in all sorts of modern educational literature, you hear this word, curiosity. Um, and again, this comes with option possibilities, but also warnings. And I want to give you both today, just to make sure that we don't lose sight of the three modalities of wonder. Because without the other two, curiosity perhaps is less effective. Uh, are you joking? Uh, we'll come to that now in a second. I find this quite amusing. Despite the focus on inquisitive curiosity in education, research shows that wonder of all kinds is continually declining. It doesn't work, basically. It hasn't worked. This thing of, let's get our students being curious. All the studies show it's not working. It's constantly declining from an early age. In students. students consulted, as part of a recent study, summarized the situation. These are quotes from the students. No one is curious about what we learn in class. We just need to do whatever the teachers tell us to do. It does not matter whether I am curious, because we just need to learn whatever we are assigned to do. Are you joking? There is nothing to be curious about when we're doing boring math or reading. So, this really paints the picture of what is, what is going on. Curiosity isn't uh, get, achieving the purchase that we might hope for in the classroom. So what do we do about that? What do we do about that? Uh, well, you might maybe have a, a sense of the answer I'm going to suggest because I've been banging on relentlessly about the need for a more holistic, redeemed integration of the different types of wonder. And if you only focus on curiosity, maybe you're missing out on what Socrates and Thomas Aquinas and Seamus Heaney intuited, um, as, I, as I outlined earlier. Um, the problem then, yes. An educational setting that values information acquisition and the right answer at the expense of a more challenging puzzlement or contemplative astonishment is furthering a modern preoccupation with mastery over mystery. Methodologies to promote curiosity are laudable, I'm not criticizing them, but they are due to failure if they prioritize aha moments to the exclusion of the ah moments of life. So we hear about these aha moments where students go, yes, I've investigated, I found the answer. But what about the moments where we just reside in contemplation at the mysterious and we direct our students to those times where there is no easy answer? or no answer maybe at all, and we get them to reflect on that. Those moments where you go, ah, okay, wow, that's, that's deeper, perhaps, than these, aha, I've got the answer, great. Curiosity needs to be accompanied by puzzlement and astonishment that reminds students there are some things that cannot be known easily, if at all. Promoting only one kind of wonder that seeks and finds answers will inevitably lead to less innate curiosity, not more. And why is that? That's quite a statement to make. Well, if the point of curiosity is getting the right answer, students will find quicker and more efficient ways at finding the answer than the often time-consuming pursuit of this ill-defined curiosity. They'll just Google something instead of think about that, maybe inquire into it, find some way of coming to the answer. They'll say, well, I can have the answer here. Here it is. I'm not going to bother with this kind of back and forth of curiosity and wonder when the point is getting the right answer. So I'm going to get the right answer. I've got it now. What's the point of this curiosity? In conditions where the right answer is the goal of education, what passes for the cultivation of curiosity or wonder can merely become a contrived obstacle course that leaves students remarking, well, that was fun, but why didn't you just tell us the answer at the beginning? If you had this answer on your lecture slides, why didn't you just skip, skip to the last slide and tell us all the stuff we need to know? Why did we have to go through this obstacle course of curiosity and inquiry and wonder to get there? Why couldn't we just Google it? So curiosity for curiosity's sake without puzzlement and astonishment, will be quite shallow, I suggest. A more holistic approach is what I suggest. The goal of education was a more holistic development of the whole person, other modalities would become more prominent. If there is no right answer, 
or the right answer is itself puzzling and unsettling, the ability to navigate those uncertain waters becomes more valuable to the student. If they're constantly encountering mystery, they're going to want the skill to wonder at things. This is where the capacity for wonder as complexity or astonishment would become valuable to the student. They're constantly encountering the mysteries of life, the mysteries of existence, the puzzlement of learning. But there isn't always an easy answer. They're going to want the skills to be able to reflect deeply on things, rather than just find the right answer. And this is a more holistic approach. An education that focuses on mastery over mystery, that makes acquisition of information, knowledge, and results its main destination, will not eradicate the unknown from the world. It will merely train its students to treat mystery as a nuisance, a threat, or a source of unease. A more holistic education is well placed to offer a perspective that's rare today, one that challenges students to focus and reflect on what they do not or cannot know. This kind of approach has the potential to be like Socrates, be like Aquinas, and provide a redeemed integration of those three modalities that we heard about earlier, curiosity, perplexity, and astonishment. It has parts of all three. Finally, you can see we're getting towards some conclusions here. But just to summarize really what we have learned so far, wonder is a happening beyond our control. Whether it manifests as curiosity, perplexity, or astonishment, or a mix of, of the above, it's characterized by a sense of importance that accompanies our encounters with the unknown. Modern societies, as we've learned, have trivialized and sidelined wonder, narrowing it to an expedient curiosity that seeks mastery over mystery. In education, inquisitive curiosity has been promoted for its ability to motivate and direct student learning. However, wonder continues to decline in all forms in the classroom, leading me to suggest that we need a move towards a more contemplative astonishment that would chart a more holistic approach that prioritizes resonance, religious, artistic, interpersonal, over an ever more frenetic and relentless societal preoccupation with the acquisition of info, control, and the right answer. This word resonance has occurred several times in my presentation, and you may be able to intuit what that means there, a resonant wonder. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about this word resonance as I conclude in a moment. But before then, I want to suggest that wonder is a topic for our time, particularly now in this frenetic 21st century we live in, across all disciplines like religion, philosophy, art, education, sociology, the sciences, wonder is at the forefront, or can be at the forefront, if we think about it and reflect on it. The trivialization, commodify, commodification, and instrumentalization that characterizes the continuing decline of wonder is typical of a frenetic, distracted modernity that prizes mastery over mystery and the appearance of things over a sense of interiority. This estrangement from wonder can manifest in all sorts of ways. Apathy, anxiety, arrogance, ignorance, yearning. And I'm sure the educator will encounter all of these in their students. They are, they're unable to wonder, so they show apathy. They show anxiety, ignorance, arrogance, a yearning for something more, perhaps, and many other responses. I want to talk about resonance, as I can see, beyond monotony towards resonance. And I want to talk about this book, this 2016 book called Resonance by sociologist Hartmut Rosa. Uh, he identifies what he calls acceleration in our time, a speeding up of technical capacity and uh, social change fueling an ever more frenetic pace of life, and is the main cause these days of alienation, non-belonging, feelings of anguish, powerlessness, and anger. He calls this a catastrophe of resonance, meaning the loss of our capacity to resonate in encounter with the sacred other, whether that be religion, in relationships with others, music, art, and the natural world. The true quality of our lives, he says, is measured not by the options and resources available to us, but by the resonance of our relationships. So you can see here he's diagnosing what John Hart was talking about in the 1980s, this epistemology of control, 
We want knowledge, we want control, we want power, because that gives us options and resources. And this is really the spirit of capitalism, of consumerism. But Rosa is saying, well, all those things lead to a catastrophe of resonance, feeling alienated, feeling not connected to others, to yourself, to the sacred other. And Rosa is saying we need resonance today. He doesn't use the word wonder, but I think, to me anyway, it's quite clear where wonder would come in to this idea of resonance. The ability to relate to things like transcendence, to other people in relationships, to art, to nature, to have meaningful connections with these people and these things. Wonder is surely at the heart of moving towards resonance. So that's what I would like to suggest is the value of wonder in today's society. And finally, the very last thing I will say is with interest, I saw a headline on RTE about the Irish educational landscape in the last few days, where empathy will be taught, taught to transition year students as part of a revised transition year. And why is this? Well, because it will lead to a, so, a social return based on happiness. Teenagers will soon be learning what empathy uh, at schools as progress is made on plans to redevelop transition year. And this man, Professor Pat Dolan, spoke very eloquently about why empathy is important today. And it's because of all these things. The loss of resonance, the loss of the ability to relate to other people, to the transcendent, to ourselves. We're losing the ability to empathize with people, to connect with them. And again, I think wonder is part of all this. We cannot wonder at things. We cannot show an integration of curiosity, of puzzlement, of astonishment. We will lose our ability to relate to other people the transcendent and to ourselves. We will lose the ability to empathize um, and relate to others. So I would suggest that maybe they should add classes on wonder as well to the new transition year. And maybe that would bring a social return based on happiness and indeed resonance, as I suggest. So on that optimistic note, I will conclude and thank you very much for your